The views expressed are not those of local community broadcasting, WYML LP, or its management, volunteers, or underwriters. Greetings and welcome to the Personal Safety Show. This is Marcus Melnick from Firearm Mentor and Stress to Logic, your host. And a few weeks ago, we interviewed Dr. David Yamini from Wake Forest University regarding his new book that's coming out called Gun Culture 2.0, which is available on Amazon, as well as his course at Wake Forest University called Sociology of Guns. I happened to enroll in the online seminar, which is not for college credit, but wow, I want to share some things that I learned. And before I do that, I just want to give you a philosophy of mine. And that philosophy is that a true expert continues to learn once they've learned it all. I am extremely well versed in the world of handguns and firearms, but boy, was I taken to school. And let me share some of the things that I learned. Uh, part of the readings and videos, this is what I picked up on. There are people who don't have any relationship with firearms, and the only information that they receive are through the media and through negatives regarding firearms. And they are asked to do something about it. There's been a long-standing relationship between, between weapons and people, specifically projectile weapons and humans. This is very interesting to me. So humans don't usually, in today's world, go very deep into the relationship between guns and gun ownership. It's really reserved for the criminologists, the epidemiologists who say, well, the guns are used in crime or guns are an epidemic, and that's why they are pursuing it. There's not much in the sociology realm. So if we start from a fair playing field with the best information available, where does that information start? Where does projectile weapons come into the planet? It's human nature, guns and weapons, and they don't exist in this bubble. They are a reflection of the internal state of humans, and we're going to go and continue on. The first place to go is the human mind and behavior. Guns are normal. Normal people use guns. Projectiles are a human cultural universal. And what that means is it's been spread out among cultures and groups, and it's not an absolute from everywhere, but basically from the emergence of our species as Homo sapiens until now, it's likely going to be a universal in the future. The reality of guns emanates from a uniquely human and universal. We are the only species that currently uses projectile weaponry, and no human society has ever abandoned its use. And that's from John Shea, who is a paleoanthropologist. He went on to say that we have been surrounded by weapons for the entirety of humanity. Firearms are an anthropological projectile delivery technology tied to the prehistoric human behavior and even pre-human behavior. And I'm going to get into this because for me, this is fascinating. Guns didn't fall out of the sky and it doesn't belong to white people or Europeans. It belongs to the species. The AR-15 is not outside of this relationship and if prehistoric humans could have developed an AR-15, they would have. There's an evolutionary theory that we come from beings that were behind us in the timeline. And based on science, the homonym timeline and humans and chimps are the only species that have developed from homonyms that are currently on the planet. The human chimp ancestors were 86 million years ago. The early hominem ancestors are 1.4 to 2.8 million years ago. Then we've got Homo erectus, which were 700,000 to 300,000 years old. And then the Homo neanderthal, which is 40, 400,000 to 40,000 years old. And then Homo sapiens emerged about 300,000 years ago. 
So there's this timeline of human weapon relationship. And 500,000 years ago, on the Cathu Plain, there were spear points that were found. Now, why is this significant? Well, I said there's it was found and dated to 500,000 years ago. But Homo sapiens did not emerge until 300 million years ago. So these so these spear points, holy cow, they predate humanity and the Kathu plain is an area in South Central Africa and humans just didn't emerge at that time. And this is science. Spear points predates humans by about 200,000 years. Projectile weapons are 200,000 years older than the human species. Wrap your brain around that. It was likely the Homo egaster, which is the African Homo erectus species. And between 400 and 300,000 years ago, Shonigan spears in what's current day Germany were found. Why were the why is this important? Well, they were manufactured, they were made by hand, but they took into aerodynamic spreads, which was likely used for throwing and thrusting. These were found at a butchering site with thousands of bo animal bones, too early even for Neanderthals to have done this. 279,000 years ago, the Ethiopian Rift Point, which is in Central and Eastern Africa, likely Homo sapiens, there's the first evidence of humans making weapons. How, quote, normal is this? How normal, and I'm putting normal in air quotes, is the relationship between humans and weapons? Well, <clears throat> we would have to examine the relationship between homonyms and weapons. Weapons preceded the emergence of our species by a couple hundred thousand years, meaning the weapons were on the planet before we were making them completely normal. Progressed in the desire to become safe from guns, people's reality today is skewed. They redefine reality based on their political view and demonize weapons, trying to redefine the actual nature of society by stating things that support the narrative, like weapons are an anomaly. They don't matter. They're only used by bad people. They are quite normal for the planet. And these are educators that are telling me this. I'm repeating the things that I've learned in this Sociology of Guns class. So if early humans were not good at weapons, we would likely not be on the planet. That's how they ate. That's how they got animal proteins. Evolutionary changes would have never occurred. 99% of the human history is as hunter-gatherers. We can't be hunters without weapons. Our reality is dependent upon past survival, and that survival is attributed to weapons, meaning it is a normal activity, a normal thing. There are progressives who try to paint weapons as an anomaly, and it's extremely unscientific. Now, here is the kicker to that. Progressives typically say, rely on the science, rely on the science. Yet, when the science does not fit their narrative, they change the science. Science is supposed to be fact, not opinion. And these people also speak about how important science is, but they're referring to their science that supports their bias, not all the science that is out there. So there is a gap between 279,000 years ago and 70,000 years ago, and it's because there was an ice age. So it kind of dwindled human populations throughout the world, and that's why there's a little bit of a gap. But 70,000 years ago, there was a composite at, it's called the composite at lateral dart and spear tip, which is the earliest evidence of a complex projectile technology. This was found in Africa and is the beginning of the anthropologic homo sapien weapon industry that is making AR-15s today. Pyrotechnic application to silcrete occurred, warming the silcrete stone so it could be worked. Multi-component wood tips with sharpened wood points, antler points were used, grooves were cut into the point and worked with pieces of silcrete which were small grooves were then glued to the side of the point, 
and that was heated and it was the glue was heated it was most likely tree sap these were penetrating aerodynamic and they were kind of like a harpoon or a fish hook that does not back out these were specifically designed for hunting they were put on a spear shaft and this is a complex prehistoric projectile it had a point it was glued there was pyrotechnic treatment heating crafting and application this is advanced technology for early humans who may not have even had language developed at that time so these projectiles can be thrown at 70 miles an hour and it's enough to kill a mammoth a woolly mammoth elephant or woolly mammoth rhino the tips could be swapped out depending on the application it was kind of like today's harpoon humans would use this to kill very large every size animal and it even was used by the inuits to kill whales which are arguably the largest animal on the planet and they also used it against each other 64,000 years ago the sibidu sibidu arrow point is the earliest bow and arrow 64,000 years ago earliest bow and arrow and there's been a project progression of the projectile for example 12,000 years ago the Nautifan arrow points in the Middle East, we start to see the democratization of weapons in large scales. And in the anthro in the archaeological record, there are hundreds of thousands of spear points in the Middle East, the Mediterranean, in the architectural, I'm sorry, archaeological archaeological record. Humans migrated out of Africa and many tribes reproduced all over the place and what we see with every tribe is weaponry the second amendment of the constitution in the 18th century is not the first emergence of weapons it's just not it's our current version now at that point humans started to grow crops cultivate the land and they needed to protect that from thieves from other tribes coming in who were more aggressive humans became a lot more aggressive and in about 5000 bce the ancient warrior combat loadout happened and this was where soldiers or warriors would wear helmets they would have slicing weapons they would have armor this is when we started seeing war on horseback. Archery starts here. And as humans begin to master metals, the armor changes the projectile. Plate armor defeated the arrow. And this pushed humans to smaller cannons and gunpowder technology, the, it, which foils armor. It evolved into the rifle, pistol, musket that we see today. And the rifle, pistol, and musket made plate armor ineffective about 1650 ce which means after or the common area we've started to develop effective firearms and again this continues to evolve 1940 not too long ago we started to use aircraft to deliver projectile weapons and those aircraft delivered bombs bullets in more recent examples missiles and even evolved into nuclear weapons and the regular public cannot get nuclear weapons i'm just giving a historical view on this so there is a human weapon relationship and it's so extensive that it predates humans it goes to the homonym weapon relationship and humans were probably equal to other fauna on the earth and the projectile weapon made humans the dominant species of the planet without weapons that would not have happened without projectile weapons that would not have happened human footprints on the moon would not have happened opining against guns on the internet would not have happened anti-gun is actually anti-scientific i'm going to say that again because it's very poignant anti-gun is anti-scientific so why are firearms present well projectile weapons firearms allow humans to acquire animal proteins also to express interpersonal violence 
offensively or defensively, and social coercion. So right now, you can do one of two things to me. You can convince me to do something, or you can force me to do something. Without the projectile weapons, force would not have worked. So I've been to two lectures, very, very stimulating. And I also learned that most of the 200 million guns owned are for socially innocuous sporting activities. Hunting, target practice, competition, collection, all of these are innocuous. The center of gravity actually shifted over the last 50 years. So previous to 50 years, most guns were owned for hunting, for sport, that type of thing. In the past 50 years, that has shifted to self-defense. The majority of firearms out there are now for self-defense. And this is behaviorally normal for the homo sapien. It stretches back to rocks, spears, bows and arrows, cross bolts, and today it's the firearm. So as you are arguing with someone who is anti-gun, you can tell them anti-gun is anti-scientific, that projectile weapons predated humanity. As I learn more and more about firearms through this, and as I read the book uh, Gun Curious 2.0, which isn't out until June, I pre-ordered it, I will certainly share that awesome knowledge with my listeners. So I thank you for listening to me go on and on about this, but I just found it absolutely fascinating. And I'm going to switch gears right after this. I want my listeners to know that this is my dream, teaching people about safety. If it weren't for you, if it weren't for my listeners, I couldn't live my dream. So on behalf of my family and myself, I want to thank each and every one of you for allowing me to live my dream. And I also want to continue to live my dream, and I'm excited to continue to spread the word of safety. Recently, I began a new service as a conference keynote speaker. So if anyone would like for me to speak at future events, or if anyone knows of an introduction or would like to discuss how we can work with one another, I'd love to do just that. The keynote speaking website is www.stress, the number two, logic.com. That is S-T-R-E-S-S, the number two, L-O-G-I-C, Dot com. If you're aware of any conference speaking engagements where you'd like to have me speak, I'd love an introduction. You can always share my electronic business card, which is Marcus Melnick, M-A-R-C-U-S-M-E-L-N-I-C-K dot com. Now back to the show. Folks, you just heard my commercial for my keynote speaking service, and I want to share with you one of my recent keynotes and the experience that I had, which was extremely positive. Back in the day, I used to be an accreditation manager in both law enforcement and firefighting. What does that mean? Well, there is a set of standards for police. There is a set of standards for the firefighting industry that if an agency wants to get this feather in their cap, this system of policies, procedures, management, they can become accredited. And when I worked for the Glencoe, Illinois Public Safety Department, I started as the police accreditation manager. So let me explain to you how this all works. There, there's a standard that says high value items like guns, drugs, cash, it's not good enough to just put them in the evidence locker. They have to be secured in the evidence locker. So the evidence, it was in my case, it was a room a large, uh, this one was a small one, another department was a very large room. And these high value items had to be placed in a safe in the locked alarmed room because they were high value and they didn't want to have temptation. So what I would do as an accreditation manager is I would say, all right, here's our policy. It says high value items have to be doubly secured. And here is the proof. And we would walk over to the evidence room. We'd have to turn off the alarm, go in, and then we'd have to open up the safe to show the auditors, yes, we are complying with the policy. So three times a year in various places in the United States, the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies 
which is shortened to Kalia, C-A-L-E-A, and their website is Kalia, C-A-L-E-A, dot org. They host a conference, and the conference has training, it has networking, vendors, and then it is ended. The last day is commission hearings, where the agencies that are up for accreditation actually present to the commission, and the commission looks at the reports, and they decide whether the agency is going to be accredited for another three years. So I used to go to these conferences. And when I started this keynote business, I looked around, I'm like, all right, what conferences have I gone to? Let's apply to go and ding, ding, ding. Guess who gets called? I do. So I went to a couple of weeks ago, I went to Montgomery, Alabama for several days and I delivered a few training sessions on overcoming the hot stress mess. And interestingly enough, this is so that police officers could, A, on the street in an emergency situation, understand that they're going to get tunnel vision, auditory exclusion, cognitive issues, inability to make decisions outside of what they've been trained for. And this is just, it's human survival. It's involuntary. So I have a program that I teach where I instruct how to overcome those blockers. And what I've been doing is I've been adjusting that from lessons learned from law enforcement, from mass shootings, from response to hot calls, whether they are police or fire or medical, anything stressful. And I've applied it to the business world. So a lot of times when we're in the business world or even when we're in a relationship on a date with our children, there's conflict. There's always conflict. We Again, we are humans. We are going to disagree. We are going to have conflict. And sometimes we have an emotional response to a grievance. So what I've done is I've adapted all of these lessons and put them into a business scenario. So when you are being asked difficult questions from a client and you're doing sales and you don't know the answers and you have this human stress response, or a board member is asking you questions, or your boss is asking you questions, or you screwed up on a Facebook post and your wife is asking you questions about it and challenging you. And you have this stress response. Not that I would know. That was a joke, guys. So we have these stress responses. They are exactly the same no matter if we are in life and death peril or something on the internet upsets us. How often do we see people arguing on the internet? Now, in my youth, I might've done that. Now I'm like, eh, you know something? I'm not gonna change anyone's mind. I have my perspective on firearms. Other people have their perspective on firearms and other topics as well. Foreign policy, wars in Ukraine, wars in Israel, abortion, all of these different I want to call them hot topics or polarizing topics is a better uh, answer for that. We tend to argue, we tend to escalate, and then we tend to unfriend our friends. That's happened to me. I've had to unfriend a couple people, and, and that's basically because they did personal attacks. These are people I really didn't see much of, um, and I didn't really want anything to do with them. I don't need to be told I'm an idiot. I, you know, when a lot of times I'm the smart one. So that being said, this program, which you can learn about at www.stress2, the number, let me do that, which you can learn about at www.stress, S-T-R-E-S-S, the number two, logic, L-O-G-I-C, dot com. In addition, my business card, my electronic business card, is marcusmelnick.com. That is M-A-R-C-U-S-M-E-L-N-I-C-K.com. I do have some upcoming seminars that I am presenting at. I'm also going to be speaking at the International Association of Business Communicators Conference in downtown Chicago in June. And I would invite you to reach out to me if you're interested in attending. About a month ago, I did a TEDx at Purdue University, and I still don't have the video, but when I do, I will be sharing it on my YouTube page, and my YouTube page is Firearm Mentor. So if you look that up, or you just want to send me an email, marcusmelnick.com, 
I can give you a link to that. So I hope everyone out there had a wonderful Easter last weekend. I know I did. I hope everyone's having a good Greek Easter this weekend. And everyone, I wish that you will stay safe. Thank you. And when we return, we'll be discussing the Illinois Gun Owners Lobby Day, or IGOLD, as well as some different developments in court cases that have occurred not only in Illinois, but across the country. So, stay tuned. The views expressed are not those of local community broadcasting, WYMLLP, or its management, volunteers, or underwriters.